Thankfully, the Bible is full of stories and passages that show us realistic expectations of life's ups and downs. Particularly, the book of Psalms is full of poetry and songs that deal with the emotions we'll feel during the ups and downs in life. The psalmist will go through love and thankfulness. Uh, they'll go through despair and difficulty. Three verses in particular that I can think of right now we'll find in Psalm 80, verses 1 through 3. Shepherd of Israel, hear us. You lead the people of Joseph like a flock. You sit on your throne between the cherubim. Show your glory to the people of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Call your strength into action. Come and save us. God, make us new again. May you be pleased with us. Then we will be saved. Here we see the psalmist cry out for several things. We see him asking for God's attention in the midst of his despair. We see him asking for God to shine his glory down in the midst of his difficulty. And we see him waiting gratefully for God's strong arm to pull him out of the valley of life. A lot of the Psalms deal with waiting and anticipation and being grateful in the midst of those problems. It's hard to be grateful when we're in the middle of waiting for something that we expect that's going to make us better and make us feel better and give us happiness. A lot similar to waiting for Christmas Day on Christmas Eve. Now, it's easy to say that we should be grateful in the midst of a difficulty. It's a lot harder to walk that out. Uh, I call that walking out what you're talking about. I, I know a few people older than me that call it practicing what you preach. In my own life, the way that I've had to find gratefulness in the midst of a, a, a problem and a difficulty, I, I went through a season of pruning where my friends and my family began to distance themselves from me. They, they started to not want to talk to me because of the relationship I was developing with Jesus. Uh, they thought that I was becoming a judgmental person because I wanted to get my own life in order. And I mean, I'm talking about childhood friends that decided that they were just not going to support me in the decisions I was making in my life. If I wasn't going to get drunk and do drugs, they weren't going to encourage me anymore. And I felt that I had no one. And I, I, I kept crying out to God to just bring people in my life and show me that I'm not alone. And I, I went to call a good friend of mine. And when I picked up the phone to call him, I realized he was on vacation. I couldn't even call the person that I felt like I knew would be there, that just at least listened to what I had to say. And I remember sitting on the couch and I was upset and I was in the middle of my, my episode of depression. And I pulled out my phone and I realized I had another friend I could call. So I, I started dialing his number and before I hit call, I realized though many people had walked away from me, God had brought new people into my life to replace those people who chose not to support me as I bettered myself. I began to review those relationships every single day and to think about the great things and the great people that God's brought into my life and to be thankful to Him for anticipating this moment of loneliness in my life. I started to remember back on the things that God's done. I was worried that I wouldn't have friends that he'd provide for me and people wouldn't be there to talk to me, but he saved me for all eternity. He gave his life and saved my soul completely. No ifs, ands, or buts. I, I couldn't realize that he was, loneliness was no issue to him, that he could solve this. Not only could he solve this, he'd be there for me. As long as I continued to press in towards him, he would, he would continue to press in towards me. Revelation says that I knock at the door and to whom would answer, I'll come in and dine. And I'll spend eternity with them. When we're going through a problem, it's hard to focus on the good things. It, it, it's, it's relatable to everyone. It, it's, it's not uncommon to just you. We all have issues that we immediately want to dwell on what's going on and focus on what's, what the problem is because we think we can solve every problem we have. But we need to learn to rely on the Lord and to wait on Him. He says, be still and know that I am God. 
And if we choose to be grateful in the bad times and in the good times, it'll be easier for us to that, for that to be our initial reaction. When we go from good times to bad times, we continue to be grateful to God. I'd like to give you two pieces of advice. Two things that if you walk away from this video and you only remember this, you took these two things away. One, we, we need to have an attitude of gratitude. That's number one. There was a study where they asked 11,000 people whether or not they had joy in their life. And the only people who said yes were the same people. Every single one of them had a practice of gratitude, a practice of being thankful every day. And it, it starts to train your mind to not listen to the lies of the enemy. When he tells you that there's no one, when he tells you that people don't like you, when he tells you that your parents will never not be mad at you, you'll start to focus on the promises of God. When he says, when you pass through the water, I'll be with you. Fear not, for I am the Lord. He, there are over 7,000 promises that God gives us in the Bible that we can turn to when we have the negativity and the pressure of the lies of the enemy pushing in on us. We must begin to practice being grateful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to remember the things that God's already done in your life. Your story may not sound like mine or the person next to you, but that does not mean you don't have troubles. We're not here to compare problems. If we all threw our problems in a pile, I promise you, go back and grab yours. But if we remember where we were to where we've come, we can realize that God has worked a miracle in our life that we could not have planned or done on our own. So we need to have an attitude of gratitude, and we need to remember the things that God has done for us in the past. God's people had been waiting for centuries for God to make a move in their community. They had been removed from the land that they were promised, brought to Babylon, they were conquered, they were treated like second-class citizens, and when they came back, they were conquered again by the Roman state. They were in a constant battle, waiting for God to answer, not only just waiting for him to solve their problems that they had, they were waiting for their savior. They were waiting for the Messiah, the, the king who would come and lead the people away from in captivity. They were waiting for Jesus. And among those people waiting for Jesus, we find Mary, betrothed to Joseph, preparing to start her life, waiting for the Lord, waiting for the Messiah, the same way everyone is. And he's here and he comes and the angel comes and tells her that he is not coming the way that we expected. That he's going to come through her and that she is going to be a part of this and that she is going to rear the Son of God and bring him up. It's not what we expected. But she maintained an attitude of gratitude and what would definitely be a difficulty when she had to explain this not only to her family, but her fiance, that she was with child, and it was not his. So when we go to the scriptures and we look to see how this new plan is introduced in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, we see the angel Gabriel come down from the Lord and give Mary some instructions. In the sixth month after Elizabeth had become pregnant, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. He was sent to a virgin. The girl was engaged to a man named Joseph. He came from the family of the line of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel greeted her and said, The Lord has blessed you in a special way. He is with you. Mary was very upset because of his words. She wondered what kind of greeting this could be. But the angel asked, said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. God is very pleased with you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king like his father David of long ago. The Son of the Most High God will rule forever over his people. They are from the family of the line of Jacob. That kingdom will never end. How can this happen? Mary asked the angel. I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you. 
The power of the Most High God will cover you. So the Holy One that is born will be called the Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth will have children, even though she is old. People thought she could not have children, but she has been pregnant for six months now. That's because what God says will always come true. I serve the Lord, Mary answered. May it happen to me, just as you said it would. Then the angel left her. We see Mary get some astounding news. Life-changing news. Something that she should be shooken up about. But she chooses to be grateful and accept and surrender to what the Lord has chosen for her life. And accept her part that she will play in the salvation of the entire world. You might think that her reaction should have been outrage or disappointment or anger for how she was about to have to spend the rest of her life. But if we continue on and we look at verses 46 through 55, her response wasn't disappointment. Her response was a song, a song of praise for all that God had done, a, a, a song of thankfulness, of being chosen to be the one, to be able to help bring this Lord and God into the world. You and I have long journeys ahead of us, complicated and difficult adventures that we're going to have to walk. But Mary sets a clear example of how it looks to rely on Jesus and be grateful in the midst of our opportunities.